The firstborn of thy sons shalt thou give unto me, and of thine oxen and thy sheep on the eighth day. Exodus twenty two twenty eight to twenty nine. Sacrifice of the firstborn was common in ancient Palestine and is mentioned throughout the Old Testament, and it's Isaac's most popular story. I'm your host Jason, and this is Dragons in Genesis. Not much is written about Isaac. Of the three patriarchs, his is the shortest story, which is comprised of only four short chapters. And in those four stories, Isaac is hardly the main character. During his childhood and sacrifice stories, Abe is our protagonist, with Isaac uttering only a few short sentences. Then with the marriage to Rebecca story, the slave Eliezer takes center stage. It's not until Isaac and Rebecca move to Gerar to escape famine that the second patriarch steps into the foreground, but that hardly counts since it's a retelling of Abe's adventures in Gerar. Isaac is a footnote in the book of Genesis, and his only real contribution is that he fathers Jacob. Isaac is also the only patriarch to keep his given name, possibly showing a lack of importance to the story and to his God. Abram is given the name Abraham by his god El, just as Jacob will later be renamed Israel. But El never favors Isaac with a God-given name. As we discussed in the previous episode, Abraham nearly sacrifices Isaac, but his hand is stayed at the last moment and a ram is offered up instead. This substitution of an animal for one's firstborn son appears in Hebrew literature after the Temple period. In older stories, the firstborn son is still given up to God. Just as those returning from exile in Babylon invented their own passages explaining why they no longer practiced human sacrifice in the story of Exodus and Deuteronomy, those who remained behind did the same thing in the patriarchal stories of Genesis. Other stories before and during the temple period mention these sacrifices made by Jewish heroes and even kings, and the practices acknowledged, though later condemned, in post-temple period stories such as Ezekiel. Now the age of Isaac at the time of his binding is never mentioned. Some argue that he is just a boy, but others use the fact that the next scene mentions the death of Sarah and they do a little math and determine that Isaac was about 37 years old. The problem with this is that these stories don't form a continuous narrative. It's not like the story says that as soon as they came down off the mountain, Sarah died. There's a binding story, and then there's the burial of Sarah story. And in the tales of the patriarchs, decades can pass between chapters. So Isaac may have been almost 40, or he may have been 10. The story simply doesn't tell us, and without reason to lean one way or the other, any opinion on the matter would be mere speculation. But the age of Isaac would make a difference in the story. If he's just a boy, then the story would play out about like we remember, with this horrible father nearly sacrificing this small child. But if Isaac is in his 30s, then he is a willing participant in his sacrifice, and that tells an entirely different story. One in which Isaac is a complicit victim. Either way, this is not a morality tale. This is not a story about faith. This is a story about blind obedience and following orders, even if it means committing an atrocity. Now, the next time we see Isaac, it's in the story of his marriage to Rebekah, which is arranged by Abraham and his main servant, Eliezer. Abraham has Eliezer swear by Abe's genitals to bring back a suitable bride for Isaac. Now, this was a common form of oath in the ancient Near East and is still practiced by a few Bedouin tribes in Syria today. The removal of one's own foreskin was a serious act, and swearing by it reminded those involved in the promise of the severity of that oath. You know how some of those Japanese mobsters cut off one of their fingers to atone for an offense? 
Imagine if they created an oath whereby someone swore on the stump left behind by Yubitsumi. That's basically what Abraham has Eliezer do in Genesis 24 too. Sort of like a Jewish version of a Yakuza pinky swear. Abe is essentially saying, Swear by my missing foreskin that you will fetch a suitable bride for my son. Now consider that for a moment. God appeared in person to Abraham and spoke to him on numerous occasions, promising countless descendants who will inherit from him a great nation which will be blessed by all the world. And Abe has so little faith in God's competence that he must send a servant to arrange a marriage for Isaac so that those descendants of his will become a reality. Taking matters into his own hand betrays the complete lack of belief that God will do what he promised. It's up to people to get things done, but if it ever comes to pass, God will receive all the credit. Like when you're injured, so you take matters into your own hands and rush to a hospital where you seek the help of doctors who save your life, and then you give praise to God for tasks that humans accomplished. Once Abraham has Eliezer's word that he'll fetch Isaac a bride, he instructs him to not find a girl outside of the family. He sends him to find a girl from his nephew's household because the patriarchs believe in incest. At least Isaac will be married to his cousin instead of his sister like Abraham was. Now, Abe would most likely have preferred to arrange a marriage with one of Lot's daughters, but they were no longer virgins. If you recall, they had children with their father and birthed two more nations, the Moabites and Ammonites. So Eliezer goes to Aram in search of a suitable relative of Isaac to be his bride. He goes to Aram with ten camels and stages them outside the city. This mention of domesticated camels is one of those jarring anachronisms we talked about in a previous episode. Camels weren't domesticated in that region until around 930 BCE, a full 800 years after the story supposedly occurred. Eliezer meets Rebecca by the well while she gathers water. There, he gets Rebecca to not only carry water for himself, but also to run back and forth to the well and water all of his camels while he sits idly by watching her work. She takes him to her house where he reveals his intentions to buy Rebecca for Isaac. He then pays for her with, quote, precious things, unquote, before taking her home to Isaac. Now this meeting a woman by the well motif will repeat in the Old Testament with Jacob and again with Moses and Saul, and it will be recycled again for the Gospel of John with Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman. And in every instance, they sit around and talk about marriage. After meeting her at the well and buying her off her family, Eliezer takes Rebekah to meet Isaac. Here is something strange, and no one is quite sure what to make of this. When Rebecca first meets Isaac, she apparently catches him doing something strange and is startled by it. In Genesis 24, 63-64, we read, And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide, and he lifted up his eyes, and he saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she alighted from the camel. Two words in this passage have been changed from the original Hebrew. The word meditate is not used. They had a word for meditation, but that's not the word the writers used in this passage. The word is never used again in Jewish literature, and scholars cannot find a parallel in contemporary writings so we aren't sure what Isaac went out to do in the field. But whatever he was doing must have startled Rebecca, and we know this by her reaction, which involves a second altered word in the text. The Hebrew doesn't say that she dismounted from the camel, or slid from the camel, or what have you. It specifically states that she fell off the camel. So a more accurate reading of the text might go something like this. Isaac went out to do something in the field, 
and when Rebecca rode closer and saw what he was doing, she fell off her camel. This raises a few questions, like what was Isaac doing in the field? Perhaps more importantly, we must ask why early scribes changed the word to meditate and changed Rebecca's reaction from falling off the camel to alighting from the camel in order to hide the fact that she was startled by Isaac's strange behavior. One legend concerning this story and his strange behavior tells that Isaac was caught walking on his hands because he had just returned from paradise. I suppose he could have been taken up in a whirlwind like some other biblical figures and later returned and then for some reason was walking on his hands. I haven't really found the significance to walking upside down after coming back from heaven, but if I ever do, I'll let you know. At this point in Genesis 24:67. It states that Isaac brought Rebekah into his tent and had sex with her, and thus she became his wife and he loved her. Note that the sex occurs before she becomes his wife. This is not a mistake. According to custom, the act of having sex with a virgin made that virgin your wife. There was no need for a ceremony or even the girl's consent. As long as her parents or male keeper was paid for her, then she became wed upon the event of intercourse. And the story tells us that Isaac loved her, but it leaves out any mention of her feelings toward Isaac. This is also not a mistake. It is because a woman's feelings didn't matter. She was now the property of Isaac. Eliezer had paid for her, purchased her from her relatives. Whether she loves Isaac or not makes no difference in the relationship or in the story. Only the fact that Isaac loves her is important. We see other examples of this throughout the Bible, such as the passage, Husbands, love your wives, and wives, obey your husbands. A woman's feelings toward her husbands do not matter. Only her obedience matters. Isaac then travels to Gerar to avoid famine, and we see a third telling of the story in which a patriarch believes that his wife is so beautiful that men will kill him if they find out that they're married, so he passes her off as his sister. Like the first two versions involving Abraham and Sarah, the second of which also involved this same King Abimelech of Gerar, This story is borrowed from the Egyptian Tale of the Two Brothers. If you're not familiar with the story, you should look it up. You'll see the inspiration for this tale and for the tale of Joseph and Potiphar's wife, which we will get to a little bit later. Now, this story isn't about actual events and was probably not understood that way since the practice of killing off a husband to claim the wife is more along the lines of what King David would do than what the Egyptians or Philistines would do. This is just a cautionary tale for Israelites who are traveling abroad to take care when dealing with foreign peoples. The story of Isaac and Rebekah in Gerar plays out much the way you would expect since you've already read it twice before. There are very few changes, and in the end, He leaves Gerar with a bunch of extra sheep and camels and whatnot. Lying about the relationship to your wife seems to be a pretty successful con that the patriarchs just keep repeating. Just like Sarah in the last story, Rebekah is also barren, and Isaac has to pray to Yahweh to intercede. Now Yahweh grants the wish, and Rebekah finally becomes pregnant. Now, Rebecca feels the babies inside of her struggling and foretells that her twins will be at odds with one another. Isaac picks Esau, the firstborn, as his favorite, and Rebecca picks Jacob, the younger brother, as her favorite. And just as it played out before in the story of Isaac and Ishmael, it's the younger son, the favorite of the wife, who will become the patriarch's heir instead of the older son, who is the father's favorite. 
It's as if we're stuck in some sort of time loop. These stories concerning the patriarchs just keep repeating over and over, generation after generation. In the story of Jacob and Esau, Jacob represents the civilized shepherds who were crafty and intelligent, while Esau represents the uncivilized hunters who were simple-minded. This trope is prominent in ancient literature. Whoever was doing the writing at the time always had heroes who shared their way of life and were more intelligent than those who walked a different path. When city dwellers told the stories, the shepherds and hunters always play the fools. When shepherds tell the tale, it's the hunters who were foolish and the city dwellers who are always evil. We see that here in the struggle between Jacob and Esau. Jacob is the intelligent, crafty hero, while Esau is the typical wild man, which is featured prominently in these ancient texts. He's similar to Enkidu in the Epic of Gilgamesh in that regard, an uncivilized, hairy man who will be outsmarted or overcome by the more advanced hero. This mirrors the conflict between shepherds and farmers we saw in the Cain and Abel story. Pastoral Canaanites didn't like sharing land with hunters or farmers. So whenever we encounter them in the stories, they're either evil or simple-minded. Think of every instance in which Abraham visits a city, like the conflict with the city in Egypt or Gerar or Sodom. But when the patriarchs meet other wanderers, they always turn out to be good people. They're messengers or servants of God, or in some cases, they're even God himself. The patriarchs never encounter an evil shepherd. You can imagine these Bedouins sitting around a fire listening to this tale, as these were oral traditions long before they were ever written. The stage is set for conflict because Rebecca is carrying twins, which means there will be contention for their father's inheritance. And we even get the not-so-subtle foreshadowing as the twins are struggling with one another before they were even born. And once the two come into the story, the stage is set for conflict with the older brother being a hairy wild man hunter and the younger brother, the underdog, being a clever shepherd. We know which side the audience will favor. We know who they are rooting for because Jacob shares their lifestyle. But how will he overcome adversity and become his father's heir? The way these stories are set up and how they play out is typical of folklore. And how this story in particular plays out will be the subject of our next episode.